O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Good morning. I'm Pastor Eric Kenna. It is wonderful to gather here with you and worship uh, as we celebrate this end of the Easter season. Next Sunday, uh, we reach Pentecost. Um, and it's always struck me as interesting that the end of the Easter season, uh, the appointed readings are actually about suffering and putting suffering in perspective, which you wouldn't think of as an Easter topic, uh, but it wonderfully does uh, weave in. So we're going to talk about um, how to understand suffering when it comes today. In light of that, I have chosen a significant number of hymns today that you have probably never seen. When Sharon has to learn two of them, you're going to want your hymnal open. <laughs> so uh, do follow along in the hymnal. Uh, a lot of the hymns are, are fairly new. They're beautiful, um, but, uh, but we'll be uh, singing them, most of us, for the first time together this morning. We also celebrate Christ as he comes in his body and blood. I'm going to remind you to review those questions and statements on the front of your service folder that are there to help you prepare your heart to receive Christ as he comes among us this morning. We join our voices in our opening hymn. We'll remain seated for the first three stanzas and we'll rise for the final stanza of the hymn. Hymn number three, 539. <laughs>
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia! Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which is obtained by his own blood. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us confess our sins to God our Father, confident that he will hear and forgive us for Jesus' sake. Most merciful God, we confess that we have not always been proud to bear your name. At times we crumble in the face of trials that come our way. We allow worries and anxieties to crowd out your caring presence. Keep us in your name, which you have given us in baptism, and forgive us our sins for Jesus' sake. God hears our prayers and forgives our sins because of Jesus' perfect life, death, and resurrection. At the command of Christ and through the power of the cross and the empty tomb, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs> This is the feast of victory for our God, Alleluia. O King of glory, Lord of your church, you suffered on the cross and defeated death and the devil for us. Make us one as you and the Father are one. Unite us with you as your body, the church, in suffering and celebration, that the world may be drawn to you and the power of the resurrection. For you are risen and reign eternally with the Father and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the lessons. The first reading is from Acts chapter 1. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. 
All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, el Kadama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The epistle is from 1 Peter, chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dom dom dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given to me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have, and have come to know the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together our common Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. 
and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the boys and girls to come forward for a children's message. Come on, Colton. We'll teach everybody together. Come on up. How are you? Good? Nice. Come on up. Welcome. You guys can have a seat here. Wow. Well, today we have kind of a hard topic. We're talking about trouble. When things get a little scary, do things ever get scary? Things a little scary sometimes? No? He has a nightlight. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yep, and, and having a nightlight at bedtime is good because sometimes the dark can be a little scary and we like to see what's around us and know that we're safe, right? <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, it does put a little shadow out there. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's actually really good because that's kind of what we're talking about today is what do we do when things get a little scary? What do we do as people who are baptized, right? As people who follow Jesus, you know what? We remember that Jesus said, I am with you always. Would you feel safe if Jesus was standing right next to you, you think, Colton? Yeah, if Jesus were right there, I'd feel really safe because I'd know that he was smart enough to solve every problem and strong enough to defend me no matter what happened. And so when things get a little scary sometimes, it's important to remember that Jesus is actually with you, that he's there to protect you. One of the things that Jesus called himself was the light of the world. Reminding us that when things get dark like a nightlight, Jesus helps us see what's really there. Sometimes in the dark, those shadows can look kind of scary because you don't know what's making it. And then the nightlight comes on and you realize that it's just the stuffed animal or it's just the way the couch is sitting today. And suddenly it's not scary at all. And so we need to remember that Jesus is with us to make sure that we always feel safe. And you know what? When I'm scared, there's a really simple song I remember, and I know that you probably know this song, but it makes me feel better. Do you know the song, Jesus Loves Me? When I sing the song, Jesus Loves Me, it reminds me that Jesus is there, and he helps me see what's really there, like a light, and he keeps me safe. So why don't we sing that together to remind ourselves, and then maybe when things get a little scary, you can remember that song and remember that Jesus is with you. Will you sing it with me? Ready? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You know that song, right? So when you get a little scary, you can remember that, and that reminds you that Jesus is with you and you have no reason to be afraid. So let's pray, all right? I'm going to say part of a prayer, and you say it up to God. Say, Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, thank you for being with me. Thank you for being with me. Help me, help me to find strength in you, to find strength in you, 
when I am afraid, when I am afraid. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Colton, can you give me five before you go? All right, good job. Can you go give me five? Can you give me a truck five? Even better. Good job. Awesome. As they return, we join in our hymn of the day, hymn number 682. of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> Peter talks to us today about the challenges of suffering. Suffering comes in many forms in our world. 
It can come simply through the world economic downturns. Uh, I remember particularly the challenges when Enron went under and a number of people I knew who were near retirement who saw everything <laughs> fall apart and realized they were going to have to continue working after they thought they were going to be finished. Um, families can fall apart. Health emergencies come. They come in all shapes and sizes and challenges. And we all experience them. And we all have the same internal experience when it happens. We begin to ask God, why? Why is this happening to me? Why am I suffering? As if we were experiencing something unusual or unique in the midst of our suffering, Satan begins to isolate us, at least internally, from the people around us who are there to support us and to be give, give us this inward focus that our suffering is something that's happening that shouldn't be happening, and it's just happening to me. That perspective causes us some real challenges. Because beyond, behind the question why that we ask is not, Lord, I would like to understand the fullness of your plan, Right? The question why is, what have I done? What did I do to deserve this? For what are you punishing me? We immediately go in the direction that suffering must be the result of sin or disobedience in our lives. And Scripture tells us over and over and over again that that is not actually true. Yes, sometimes God disciplines us in order to help us to grow into the moral people that he wants us to be. Just like we discipline our children when they act out so they can learn that certain behaviors in the long run are harmful. Certain behaviors in the long run will destroy your relationships, so we're going to curb that right on the front end, right? We're going to have some discipline. You're going to be grounded or punished so that you learn that this behavior will lead to something even worse, uh, and we're not going to accept that. And there are moments when God comes into our lives and says, I see where this path is taking you. I am going to let you experience the fullness of the consequences now so that you won't become what you could on this path. He says, uh, Peter says, uh, that God disciplines us like beloved children because of who he wants us to make us. But when suffering comes and you have no idea where it came from or why, that's usually not discipline. My experience with God's discipline is when it comes, I know pretty quickly exactly what it is that God's talking to me about. I know exactly what I did or said or thought or the attitude that was inappropriate and exactly how this consequence is experienced because of what God is correcting in me. I've never gone through a season where God disciplined me and I had no idea what the problem was. Almost always on the front end, I knew exactly what it was. But God uses suffering in a much more important way throughout Scripture. And I want you to think about it like this. I have tried for years, and my physique demonstrates the great effort and length I went to to demonstrate that you can get stronger on the couch. <laughs> that you can build yourself up by avoiding pain, by avoiding resistance, by avoiding pressure and the weight of lifting heavy things. And you see where it's gotten me. The reality is, our bodies need heavy things to come along to strengthen us. Our bodies need us to have resistance and pressure so that our muscles can grow, so that our body can be strong and healthy. And without resistance, without pressure, without a little bit of struggle, you will not be as healthy as you could be. Your body will not be all it can be. And you will not be able to do things that you would like to be able to do or feel you should do. I can't run out on the basketball court right now and go up and down that court three or four times without needing to stop. And I would like to be able to play for an hour. I used to be able to play for an hour, right? So what do I need to do? Avoid more pressure? 
Or do I need to get out there and start running? Do I need to get to the gym? Do I need to build a regimen that allows my body to grow stronger by intentionally experiencing resistance, by intentionally lifting the weight of heavy things and developing my body in the way that God would want it to be developed. The same is true for our spiritual lives. To be all that we can be for Christ, to be all that God wants us to be, we actually need resistance. Ease, spiritually sitting on the couch, does not lead to a strong and vital and vibrant spiritual life. It leads to a spiritually flabby life, to weakness. And when the challenge comes that you want to be able to do, when God offers you an opportunity to step up that's going to be difficult, if you haven't built yourself up spiritually to that challenge, it will be just like running out on a basketball court without having run in years. You're going to get out there and try and collapse in the middle of it. And God doesn't want that for us. God wants us to be vital and vibrant and energetic in our spirit. And so it requires us from time to time to lift heavy things. The same is true for our emotional well-being. If, anyone, if everyone just coddles you and tells you that everything's okay and they're going to take care of it and you never have to do any emotional heavy lifting, if you never have to support anyone else, if you never have to be strong emotionally, you're not going to have the capacity to when the trial comes. And so we need to lift heavy things for the sake of our spirits and our emotions. We need to be having resistance in our lives so that we grow stronger and become the kind of people that God truly wants to use, as Paul would say, so that we can spiritually run the race that's set before us. And Paul tells us in that passage that to spiritually run the race set before us, we have to train ourselves. When we see suffering and trials and difficulties come, we often shout, woe is me, this isn't supposed to happen. And Jesus is instead saying, what I really want is for you to grow stronger. What I really want is for you to become the kind of person that can live up to the challenge and the kingdom work that I have for you that's way up here. And so I'm going to give you these challenges so that you learn how to be that person so that you grow strong enough to accomplish God's will in the big thing. Because he doesn't just let you sort of meander through your life and then drop the big thing in and zap you with the Holy Spirit and suddenly you're good to go. God works organically in our lives, spiritually and emotionally, the same way we need to work physically. And so rather than saying, woe is me when the challenge comes, we need to have a different perspective. Begin to ask, what is God training me for? I always thought it was curious in the Old Testament why God, having revealed his great work and the great faith that David had in slaying Goliath, then had David sit in Saul's court to be abused by the king for years, to have to play music when he would get in his depressive rages, and then to run away from him when the king was trying to take his life. Like, what is that all about? But if you go through and you look at it, what you see is through all of those trials, through all of that suffering, in its increasing greatness for David, grew him from a shepherd boy with the faith to kill a giant to the kind of man who could lead a kingdom to the pinnacle of its greatness. And if he hadn't learned how to manage a raging king, he would never have been able to handle advisors who gave him bad advice or foreign adversaries who wanted to negotiate in bad faith or all of the different things that he was going to have to deal with. But step by step, God built David up through the trials he endured at Saul's hands to be able to become the great King David that we know. Peter certainly gets zapped by the Holy Spirit and transforms, but we also see in Peter this great growth curve that God has put in his life. That Peter is now, because of the trials he's endured, because of the rebukes of Jesus, because of his standing in the courtyard and rejecting Jesus, and having been restored, 
we see a Peter who has confidence in the gospel in a way that we never would have imagined from reading the gospels. In our men's Bible study yesterday, we were in Acts chapter 4 and 5, and we see Peter stand up in front of the Sanhedrin. This same Peter, who, if you remember, in the courtyard, ran away from a servant girl who questioned whether he had been with Jesus. Like a 13-year-old girl says, I think you were with him. He's like, ah! Now he's in Jerusalem under arrest, and the, the Sanhedrin brings out the big guns. Four, well, one high priest and three former high priests, so four high priests are now standing over, literally, Peter and asking how dare he speak the name of Jesus. And Peter, who ran away from a 13-year-old girl, now faces the most powerful men in Israel and lays it out and says, you crucified Jesus and he died for your sins and he rose again and we will speak this name. How did that happen? Certainly the Holy Spirit was a part of that. But if you look at the moment after Jesus' arrest to Acts chapter 4, you're going to see that through all of the trials that came, Peter began to rise to the occasion, to step up to those. And the church suddenly finds itself in a whole new place and a whole new attitude. What I'm really telling you is you need to have a different perspective when suffering comes. So here's Acts chapter 4. So they get released. The, the, the high priests, four of them, are completely dumbfounded that this country bumpkin from the north of Israel is suddenly standing up when they thought he would cower and beg for his life. And they go back to the church. And the church says, begins to pray. And here's in Acts chapter 4. They prayed, they gathered together up that, so they use a passage from Psalms about how the whole world will, will rise up against God. And he says, for truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, representative of the Jewish nation, and Pontius Pilate, representative of the Gentile nation, along with Gentiles and the people of Israel. They rose against Jesus. Why? to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. That what happened to Jesus, the violence of the world against Jesus, wasn't the world winning. It wasn't that God wasn't strong enough to stop it. It wasn't that he didn't have a plan when it came out of control. Rather, all of that craziness that no one understood was exactly your plan. And now we see it. When the world rose up and Jesus suffered like no one has ever suffered, it wasn't because God couldn't stop it, but rather because his plan was so great that we couldn't see it. So what of it? And now, Lord, look upon the threats that they speak against us and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and do signs and wonders. They see the Pharisees rising up. They realize that this is not, that Peter has not ended the battle, but rather it's only begun. Because they're going to regroup and they're going to come after us. And what is their prayer? Knowing that the most powerful men in Israel are coming after the church. Lord, defeat your enemies. Lord, strike them down. Lord, protect us. Lord, shield us. No. Lord, give us boldness. Lord, let us stand up to them no matter what. Lord, give us courage. Lord, bring it on. Can you imagine if the church stood up today instead of cowering at all of the threats of the world and said, Lord, give us boldness. Lord, bring it on. And why could they say that? Because they saw in their possible suffering the continual working out of God's plan. Not the opposite of God's plan, not things going out of control, but rather exactly what God needs in order to spread the message. And so it is that Peter says in our epistle lesson to not consider this as something strange 
Brothers, don't be surprised when the fiery trials come. Jesus said that they were coming. Jesus said that the world would come after us. And when it comes upon you, he says, to test you as if something strange were happening to you. But rejoice. Rejoice as you share in Christ's suffering. Throughout the history of the church, men and women of faith have seen suffering as a partnership with Christ, in joining his walk down, his march down the Via Dolorosa, carrying our cross, in sharing in the suffering of the cross and experiencing some little taste of what Jesus endured on our behalf. We are in one of the first generations to see suffering as something strange, that comfort is the norm, that pleasure is the object. The world, until very recently, has assumed that suffering was the norm, that pain was normal, and moments of joy and peace and happiness were actually the strange thing that you grasped for when it came. We need again to see God's plan at work in our suffering, to realize that he uses it to grow us, to increase us, to build us up to something greater that he has in store, and to realize that we share in Christ's suffering. The other part that we often miss is that we're so convinced that this life is all there is, that we're trying to get everything we can out of it, and anything that disrupts the gaining of our pleasure in this life disrupts the only good we'll ever have. And can I tell you it's the exact opposite? This is as bad as it's ever going to get. This life is as horrible as it will ever, ever be because you have a life to come. You have Christ coming. He will bring you with him to the place where he is in heaven, in peace, and then he will remake this earth and you will stand on it in a place with no more sin, no more greed, no more violence, no more anger, no more tears. We need to keep that bigger perspective in mind that, as Paul calls them, these light and momentary trials are nothing in comparison to what God has for us. So Peter ends with this encouragement, and you've probably experienced this if you think through your own life. He says, when we endure trials, that after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to the eternal glory with Christ will himself restore you. Have you gone through trials and been restored? Have you gone through a difficult time and found yourself back on your feet by the grace of God? That restoration, did it confirm your faith? It absolutely did. Peter says when God restores you, you will be confirmed. Your faith will be confirmed. And when your faith is confirmed, you become stronger. Like after lifting those weights that tear your muscles apart, they will be rebuilt stronger than they were before. And in that strengthening, you will be established and become unmovable when the next trial comes. Peter tells us that going through these trials, we can look forward to the moment when we are restored. Because our faith will be confirmed, we will become stronger and better, and we will be more established in God's kingdom. May we be a people who learn how to suffer well, to see the resistance that God allows against us in the world as his plan to grow us into the mighty saints he intends us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise as we go to the throne of grace in prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray with boldness and confidence because we know he hears our prayers and because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of the church. Watch over all who lead your people. Shape them to be men and women after God's own heart. Fuel them with word and sacraments and guide them to walk in your ways. We pray for our Synod President Matthew, for our District President Allen, for the servants of our congregation. Lead them as they lead us, because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.
O oh Jesus, we pray for all who are suffering trials because of their Christian faith. Comfort them and lead them to rejoice as they share in your sufferings that your glory is revealed because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Holy Father, we grieve the divisions of our families, communities, world, and especially in your church. Keep all your people in your name which you have given in the waters of baptism, and lead us to the unity we will experience fully with you in your kingdom, because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. O great physician, bind up the brokenhearted and heal those who are suffering in heart, soul, strength, and mind. We pray this day for those who are grieving and ask you to give them comfort as they mourn. We pray this day for those who are suffering from illness, remembering especially Mike, Linda, Ed, Megan, Chris, Veronica, Greg, Rogers, Clara, Jeff, Diane, Jerry, Carmen, Katie, Betty, Jen, Jim, Don, Margaret, and those we name before you in our hearts. We ask that you heal them according to your good and gracious will, because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We trust, O oh Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. We worship the Lord with our gifts of love and offerings. We remind ourselves why giving is a call of discipleship with our offering dedication. Everything we have is a gift from God. All that we have and are belong to God, bought with the blood of Jesus. Lord, help us be a people who live lives of sacrificial generosity so that there are no needy persons among us. Let us be generous because our Father is generous, and it is our joy to share his generous heart with the world. You may be seated. rise. I invite you to open your hymnal to hymn number 652 as it's probably unfamiliar to you and help join in us as we prepare, as we offer our gifts to the Lord.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at every time, in every place, thank you, our God, who is our creator and has given your one and only Son to suffer and to die for the sins of the world before rising victorious on the third day, appearing before his disciples, before ascending into heaven to lead us to your glory that awaits us. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, protector of widows. As you marched before the people of Israel, you sent your son Jesus to march before us, suffering and dying for the sins of the world. Bring us together at our Lord's table today as we eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Savior, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the very night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. setting up, I'll remind you there are gluten-free wafers. If you would prefer that, please indicate that. Uh, in the trays, the white wine is alcohol-free. The red wine is regular uh, wine, so you have those options as you approach as well. Welcome to the Lord's table. Mm -hmm.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life everlasting. Depart in joy and peace and remember your Savior. Amen. We thank you, Jesus, for gathering us at your table as an oasis for our parched and weary souls. Strengthen us as we face fiery trials and suffering so that your glory may be revealed. For you live and rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our departing hymn. We will sing the first three verses of our departing hymn, verses one through three. things to highlight as we go. Uh, you probably didn't notice and I didn't announce it ahead of time just uh, so he wouldn't get nervous, but Charlie Nelson actually played the first communion hymn. Uh, so our own Charlie Nelson who uh, jumped off of the projection and onto the organ. So let's show our appreciation for Charlie with his first in service um, leading the hymn. Thank you. It was wonderfully done. Um, a couple of things to note, uh, we're looking for submissions. If you know somebody who's graduating middle school, high school, college, please uh, submit their information to the church office. Um, uh, Emmanuel Family Camp at uh, Wall Camp, June 9th through the 11th. Information in your news and notes. Uh, we'll be gathering out there with as many as would like to come uh, for a fellowship and fun out there. And June 18th will be our next voters' assembly. So place that on your calendar. Hopefully there will be some big things in that voters assembly. So please rise as we go. We prepare ourselves reminding us who we are and what we are about. That we serve Emmanuel, God with us, 
Wherever we go, God in us, making us new. God through us, his hands and his feet. You are blessed to be a blessing. Alleluia, alleluia. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.